Shalom again. It is really wonderful to see some people I haven't seen in 14 or 15 months. It's really great to see you in person. Because we're all a member of Shir HaMalot. The top here of our ark are the words Shir HaMalot, a song of ascent. And yes, I got to use this for the first time. Fantastic. Shir HaMalot, why are we called Shir HaMalot? We used to be a Harbor Reform congregation for those who've been in Orange County a long time. Harbor Reform. 1974, a terrible thing happened in the state of Israel. In a northern city known as Ma'alot, there, were, uh, there was a group of students who were on a hike from one end of Israel to the other, and they were spending the night in a schoolhouse. And a terrorist came from Lebanon and found the schoolhouse because he heard that they were spending the night there and killed 23 students. 1974, Rabbi Bernie King, may he rest in peace, decided along with the board of trustees that they were going to make a living memorial right here, then in Newport Beach, but in Irvine, California, to have those kids live in every act that we do in this congregation. And so we changed our name to Shir HaMalot, much harder name to say than Harbor Reform, but worth the effort to be sure. When I came to the congregation in 2001 and we took our first trip in 2005 to Israel, we made sure we went to Ma'alot. And every trip since then, I think it's about 10 now, we have always gone to Ma'alot. In fact, we came to know the teacher of those students who died, a man named Bitzalal Dahan, who came to our congregation 13 years ago at our 40th anniversary and spoke to us. And just five years ago, when last we were there, we noticed that the memorial in the classroom in which these students were killed was quite dilapidated. So we raised about $25,000 in our congregation and refurbished this working classroom, this working classroom still. So that was another tribute. Make sure you continue to teach students in that classroom. So we have this beautiful, beautiful memorial there. I'm very proud of it. We restored the memorial five years ago, and so we have remembered the past. But now, what is Ma'alot's future? What is Israel's future? The three points of my sermon tonight, there are hundreds of smaller points. I'm not able to address everything tonight. How much the more so we're not able to address a centuries-old conflict in a tweet or a post, or even in an essay or in a sermon. We can only talk about some of the issues. Why? Because these are complicated and deeply nuanced issues. Anyone who reduces them to a quip or an uninformed post does not do the people who are suffering justice. Rabbi Amiel Hirsch of the Stephen Wise Free Synagogue in New York City said last week a comment that really resonated with me. He said, I stand by Israel, not uncritically, but unconditionally. That's how I feel. It's how I feel about America, and it's how I feel about Israel, for different reasons, but with no less passion. My first point tonight will be that the Jewish people have a right to live in and defend their own historic homeland and the lives within that homeland. Second, I will take a moment to reflect on the opportunities before Israel if she chooses to take them. And lastly, I will offer a challenge to those who take every opportunity to criticize Israel at every chance they get, Jewish and non-Jewish alike, to point one. You read the press or watch the news, you would think that Israel is simply bombing Gaza indiscriminately without provocation or justification. They claim Israel's response is disproportionate. It's funny. When America attacked Afghanistan to root out the evil terrorists that were there with overwhelming firepower, I never heard anyone on the news or any commentator talk about disproportionate use. 
or disproportionate response. If 4,500 bombs were sent to kill innocent civilians, I hope the victims use all its power to eradicate the source of that evil. And I hope it's disproportionate, for that's the only way to stop it. Context is everything. And people don't believe in context. It's like it doesn't exist. It was not even 80 years ago when one-third of the Jewish people, six million lives, were wiped off the face of the earth. Every survivor I have ever talked to has said to me, Rabbi, if there were only in Israel, this wouldn't have happened. Jewish self-determination and Jewish power are nothing to be ashamed of. It's what keeps us alive. If a tyrant says that they want to kill you and wipe you off the face of the earth, believe them. They're not lying. Hamas, Islamic Jihad in Gaza, Hezbollah in Lebanon, all Iran-backed, want only one thing, and that is for Jews and Judaism to be wiped off the face of the earth, particularly in the land we call Israel. Make no mistake, these are Nazis, fast-forwarded eight decades. They have no interest in helping their own people. My heart breaks for the Palestinian people, for the oppression they live under, under their own governments. They are, that is Hamas and Hezbollah, a radical terrorist movement set on one goal to make Israel no more. While the Middle East is a very nuanced place, there is no nuance about that fact. If Hamas puts rocket launchers on hospitals and press buildings, what choice does Israel have? Israel's army does more than any other army I have ever heard about or seen to try and mitigate the death of innocents. The army literally calls people on their cell phones and tells them to leave the building for it will be bombed in an hour. That is an army that does not want to kill innocent people. But neither will such an army let its own people be bombed without protection or a response. It's ridiculous to think otherwise and irresponsible to not respond. Israel most certainly has tremendous power. It's how it uses its power that's critical. She uses her power, I believe, to save lives, not to take lives. Rabbi Yitz Greenberg wrote about Jewish power more than three decades ago. He said, power corrupts, but there is no other morally tolerable choice. The alternative is death. This is the lesson that the Jewish people learned from the Holocaust. He continues, driven by the will to live, survivalist Jews have become overwhelmingly Zionist. This is 30 plus years ago even if they have no intention of ever living in Israel. Goaded by the absolute pain, the Holocaust, goaded by the absolute pain of the Holocaust, American public opinion became pro-Zionist and has stood by Israel ever since. All understand that Jews must have access to the kind of power and guaranteed haven that only a government and an army can provide. You wouldn't expect any less for America or Americans. We shouldn't expect any less for Israelis, Jews and Arabs alike. So Israel has not only a right, but an obligation to defend herself. But the question arises, and it's a fair question. Given Israel's power, how does she use it? Herein are some of Israel's challenges and opportunities. The settlements, however intentioned, is and has always been a bad idea. If two states are ever to come in that land, this policy must stop. And for peace, I hope and pray Israel will do what she has done in the past, make it right. For Israel, the proof's in the pudding, by the way. She is willing to trade land for peace, but there has to be peace. 
the Camp David Accords in 1970 gave away the Sinai Desert, which was double the size of Israel proper, a big buffer zone between Israel's arch enemy for 2,000 years. <clears throat> 2,000 years was important enough to do to make peace. Withdrew, withdrawing from the Gaza Strip in 2005. Go ahead, be the master of your own destiny. We're out. We need leaders in Israel who will enfranchise the Palestinian people, not disenfranchise them. Again, context is everything. Israel is not perfect, but Israel is judged by Western standards when she lives in the Middle East. I'm glad she's judged by Western standards, by the way, because we always in the West have to push Israel to live better and higher, but understand the context. It's no excuse, but understand the context. Where else in the Middle East do you have the following things? Find me a country in the Middle East where Jews or any other minority sits in the parliament. In Israel, there are several seats in the parliament for Muslims and for Arabs. Show me where in the Gaza Strip LGBTQ community is celebrated and lauded like they are in Israel. It doesn't exist. Show me in Saudi Arabia how women are treated. Show me in Syria how the justice system works. Please show me. It's not an excuse for Israel to do wrong, but it's context and it's important context. Israel has got work to do, very serious work. And I don't excuse her heirs, misdeeds, or injustices, but I simply ask that we see all of these issues in context while insisting Israel use her power to make all of her citizens and those in the territories enfranchised. Of course, in 2005, when Israel left Gaza and moved Jewish settlers out of Gaza against their will, took the Israeli army to move Jews out, Hamas was somehow elected to be the Gazan government. Not sure how that happened, but that is the opposite of giving people a chance to better themselves. Israel sadly took away the lesson that when you give land for peace in 2005, you only get millions of bombs in return. It's the definition of a no-win situation. And it is in this area of looking at Israel compared to the rest of the world that I offer my challenge and observation to those critical of Israel. Whenever Israel defends herself, the press, the commentators, organizations of all stripes seem to focus like a laser beam on Israel's imperfections. I never see this kind of attention paid to Zambia, whose human rights abuses are horrific, or China's concentration camps, or Turkey's purging of any politician who differs with their president or the human rights violations even in Gaza and the West Bank at the hands of their own leaders, Hamas and Fatah. Why is that? Why is it that Israel gets all the attention? I have a theory in my gut that there is an underlying anti-Semitism, anti-Jewish feel to all the criticism that Israel gets. No one ever questions the legitimacy of whether Jordan should remain a country. No one ever questions the Vatican, given its policies, whether it should remain Roman Catholic or the UAE Muslim. But Israel, her very existence is begrudged and threatened every single day. So my challenge is this. If a person chooses to be critical of Israel, as I have tonight in some measure, I ask that you also be critical of all other nations in the same degree. That will prove that you don't begrudge Israel her very life, but that you are striving to make her and all nations better. Curiously and gladly, I don't see any anti-Zambian attacks in the streets of Los Angeles or anti-Turkish mobs looking for Turkish homes in New York, but we see it of Jews chased down in the street, beaten up in restaurants. It is a lot more than just people's upset at the policies of the Israeli government. There is an anti-Semitism that is so clear to me 
that it pervades this whole argument and criticism of Israel. Please, if you are going to criticize Israel, demonstrate your hate of all kinds of oppression, not just when you perceive Jews as the oppressor. And try to speak up not only when bombs are being pelted upon Israel and her citizens, but in every moment. Those who align the Palestinian cause with other oppressed people, I understand. It's a natural instinct. But please know the facts and the nuances and the context. Please align all those causes together. Not just Israel's perceived problems, because if you only focus on Israel to the exclusion of all other people you deem oppressors, that raises the question as to your real motivation. I suppose for the Jewish person who is so outspoken about and against Israel, maybe it's Israel's power that makes them nervous or true belief that Israel is not living up to her Jewish values. I can accept that. But I would suggest that Israel, Judaism, and Jews have enough enemies and detractors that to constantly be barraged in public by our own family is troubling to me. Imagine a world for you as a Jew without Israel is all I would ask as you make your statements about Israel. Imagine that. The Israeli people will only be free when all people are free in that region. And to the extent Israel can bring about for the Palestinians that about for the Palestinians, she ought to do everything in her power to make it so. The one thing the Jewish people would ask is for peace and safety in return. And with Hamas in power, I can assure you that will never come to be. That being said, if Israel could figure out how to start a nation three years after the Holocaust ended, Israel can figure out how to create a place of peace and security for all. Let's just return for a moment to Shir HaMalot. And I want to point out one line to you. And it's this line here, which simply says, those, those who sow in tears shall reap with songs of joy. Our eyes are crying for Jews and Arabs alike who have been caught in the crossfire. But soon I hope together our children will sing in a choir of peace of love, of respect, of self-determination for the Palestinian people and for the Jewish people. Amen. Those who sow, who sow in tears, reap in joy, will reap in joy. Those who sow, who sow in tears will reap, will reap in joy. Those who sow, who sow in tears will reap in joy, will reap in joy. Those who sow, who sow in tears will reap, will reap in joy. It's the song of the dreamer From a dark place it grows Like a flower in the desert The oasis of our souls Come back, come back where we belong You who hear our longing cries Our mouths, our lips are filled with song You can see our tear-filled eyes Those who sow, who sow in tears We'll reap in joy, we'll reap in joy. Those who sow, who sow in tears, will reap.